For the last part of section 1.2, we'd like to look at some different issues in evaluating statistical studies. And um, so if you're reading through a news article or a scientific article, something like that, and you come across a study, um, there are a few things to keep an eye out for um, that may indicate some issues with the study or the way data was collected. And, you know, not all of these are guarantees of like, oh, this is a bad study or something. It's just things that you need to, to watch for to think, okay, could this have impacted the results or is it not very likely that this was going to change anything? Okay, so we'll go through a few of these most common problems here. And this is out of the textbook if you want to read it there as well. And the first is problems with samples. So we just went over different sampling techniques and a sample must be represent representative of the population. And if it's not representative of the population, that sample is biased, okay? A biased sample can give results that are inaccurate and not valid, right? If some people are much, much more likely to be chosen to be part of this study than others, does that have an impact? Is that gonna cause some bias? These are some things to ask yourself about when you're looking at that study. All right, the next one is self-selected samples. This is something that we looked at already. This is otherwise known as a volunteer sample. Okay, and this is responses only by people who choose to respond, such as call-in surveys or rating websites, etc. And these are often unreliable because, again, this is going to draw out strong opinions. Okay, so we need to take into consideration, are these people just choosing to respond? Okay, are they more likely to feel one type of way or another? Um, that may have an impact on the results. Okay. Next, sample size issues. Samples that are too small may be unreliable. Larger samples are better if possible. We're kind of seeing that when we looked at the idea of sampling with or without replacement. In the larger population with uh, you know, larger sample size probably, those uh, two techniques produce more similar results as opposed to sampling from a much smaller population where there was more of an impact. Okay, so a small sample or a small population to draw from may cause issues. But as they say here, some situations having small samples is unavoidable. Um, like crash testing cars or medical testing for rare conditions. Uh, we don't want to subject, subject too many people to that. So a small population, a small sample size is sometimes, you know, the best we can or should do. Okay, next, undue influence. So here, this is when people are collecting data or asking questions in a way that influences the response. So it's like a leading question. Um, so the one that I could think of for this off the top of my head um, was like someone is surveying people about um, whether or not they eat meat products, for instance. Um, so they might say something like, do you support the murder of innocent animals, okay, to eat them. All right. So, you know, I'm not saying an opinion one way or the other about vegetarianism, veganism, um, anything along those lines. Um, Plant-based diets are great for the environment. But if someone is collecting their data in this way by surveying people and saying, do you support the murder of innocent animals to eat them? 
that is a leading question. People are more likely to answer one way versus another because, you know, people don't usually like to think about murdering innocent animals. So it's influencing the responses that could come here. All right, so that's undue influence. The next is non-response or refusal of the subject to participate. And the collected responses may no longer be representative of the population. So um, non-response might be, you know, uh, email surveys, for instance, like you go to Starbucks and then they later send you a survey that says, how did we do? And, you know, if it was just like, fine, uh, you might not respond, you might not get back to them. I know I frequently don't. So yeah, uh, non-response, the responses they do get might not really be representative of what's going on. Again, this is kind of like self-selected samples. Um, people can refuse to participate and that can really lead to people with just strong opinions choosing to participate. So it can have an effect sometimes. All right, next, causality. A relationship between two variables does not mean that one causes the other to occur. So they may be related or correlated because of their relationship through a different variable, or they might not be related at all. Um, yeah, there's a little saying that you may or may not have heard um, that says, correlation does not imply causation. Just between, just because two things are correlated or they, they match up with one another doesn't mean that one thing caused the other to happen. So for an example of this, go to the side here. Where did it go? There it is. <laughs> so for an example here, I have a graph um, this is from a, a pretty interesting website about correlations, uh, tylervision.com. Um, and it correlates the per capita consumption of mozzarella cheese in the United States versus civil engineering doctorates awarded in the United States. Okay, so the green is uh, people eating cheese and the red is civil engineering PhDs being earned. So as you can see, um, here he's got from the years 2000 to 2009, those are correlated. The two data sets follow a similar pattern, um, kind of an upward trend over those nine years. And he actually has a statistic for correlation here. There is a 96% correlation between the two data sets. So these are correlated but this does not imply causation. People eating more cheese did not cause more people to earn civil engineering PhDs. And more people earning PhDs didn't cause people to eat more cheese. I don't think either one of those is true. So they're correlated, but it's not causing each other. There's not a causation or causality relationship between these two. Okay, so there are lots of interesting correlations like that. Um, some of them can be kind of funny. Okay, next we have the idea of self-funded or self-interest studies. A study performed by a person or organization in order to support their claim. So these happen uh, quite a bit. Um, something to look for is to follow the funding, okay? When you look at a study or study results, who funded that study? Who put up the money to allow the researchers to do this job? Is it impartial? Does the person giving the money have some sort of skin in the game here? Do they have and interest in the outcomes. You gotta read carefully to evaluate the work. 
don't automatically assume that the study is good, but also don't automatically assume the study is bad either. Evaluate it on its merits and the work done. Okay, so most of the time, if we hear about these in the news, it's usually because there was some bias and an impact um, based on self-interest. For example, um, somewhat recently, there were some studies done on vaping and the safety of it um, that were funded by a company that makes vapes. Um, they were funded by Juul. So, you know, if you see something like that, you can't automatically assume that it's a good study or a bad study. You need to see how the study was done. And this is a big part of why we study statistics. We need to see how did they do this? And was there a bias? Was this actually set up well? Um, can we trust this? Because looking at who funded it, I mean, Jewel has an interest in people vaping. So those studies did turn out to be biased. And I believe there were some lawsuits about it, if I remember correctly. So follow the funding and evaluate the study on its merits and the work done. Okay, next is the misleading use of data, all right, which uh, often has improperly displayed graphs, incomplete data, or a lack of context. And this also happens a lot, especially in the graphs area. Um, if you read the introduction to the chapter one module on Canvas, there's a pretty uh, interesting little misleading graph in that page. Um, but yeah, data can be used or structured to intentionally mislead people. So if things are vague, if there's a lack of context, um, if it looks incomplete, and we'll look at some different things to identify on graphs, but these are all just things to watch out for. And then the last one here is confounding, when the effects of multiple factors on a response cannot be separated. Confounding makes it difficult or impossible to draw valid conclusions about the effect of each factor. And this can largely be prevented with good study design or good experiment design, which we'll look at later. But confounding can really be um, confusing, confounding, just frustrating sometimes. Um, often, especially in studies about the human body, because it is such a complex system and so many different factors affect different things. For instance, if you're doing a study on sleep, there are so many factors that go into a person's time spent sleeping, the quality of their sleep, et cetera. You know, you might not be able to tell if a person is getting more or less sleep due to, you know, is it their diet? Is it their stress level? Is it the temperature of the room? Is it the um, quality of their sheets? Is it the noise levels? There are so many things that go into it that it makes it difficult or impossible to come up with what is actually causing the results. So that's confounding. All right, so all of these are good things to keep in mind when you're looking at studies so that you can be a critical evaluator and an informed citizen and see whether the study is one that you agree with and trust the conclusion.